Well, what we do know is that um, with less than a week to that debt exchange deadline, uh, we're asking that question as to whether or not it's even feasible uh, for government to exempt individual uh, bondholders and still successfully implement the uh, deal austerity plan with the International Monetary Fund. Of course, the government says all it's doing now is to do so, so we're able to meet that target of the IMF by reducing our public uh, debt portfolio. Uh, will that work if we exempt the individual bondholders? Because mind you, the Ghana Association of Bankers have secured a deal already uh, with the Ghana Association of Bankers. So uh, guess what? I'm being joined now by Kweku Adoboli, he's an investment banker, uh, and it's such a pleasure to have you. Welcome yes, to the man. polls. Yes, indeed. Uh, Happy New Year as well. It's, Happy New Year it's not indeed. too late to say Happy New Year. Uh, let, let's get to this. We need to make our viewers follow what's happening. So here's what's happening as we speak. Uh, we do know that the participation target, according to the finance ministry, is that they want to seek uh, some 80%. That's the target for the finance minister uh, of the, I mean, those who subscribe onto the domestic debt exchange program before we roll onto the IMF program. Now, uh, we know, however, that that question has always come up as to whether or not this is a binding one or not. The minister has provided some answers to that. Quickly, that's correct. He says it's not binding. <clears throat> so we have a sense that it's not going to be binding as of now. Beyond that as well, there are more issues to explore so that our viewers are able to follow. So let's go to the next uh, slide, uh, which talks about uh, even issues relating to the shifted timelines which government has, has done over the years. So uh, there was a mass rejection when government announced this plan to extend the, 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 the debt uh, exchange program to the domestic sector. Of course, the first deadline was the 19th of uh, December 2022. That didn't work, so government had to revise that, obviously, to the end of last year, which is December 30, 2022. Then we started off this year, of course, uh, on Christmas, government gave us a sense that they were going to extend this, uh, and so they're going to work with the new deadline. And this is the new deadline we have here, uh, January 16, but it didn't work, so the finance ministry decided to engage before the very last one now, which is January 31st. At that point, we got a sense that we're going to involve individual bondholders because government didn't give that clear timeline that that is what was going to happen. So that's where we are within this window, last six days for the individual bondholders to try and make a case as to whether or not they would have to be exempt at this point. Yeah. And that's where I want to get your thoughts, Kofi, uh, quick uh, because there's the issue as to whether or not there's indeed the alternatives for us. Okay, so wow, there's a lot, there's a lot to, to, yeah, to work to with unpack, there. Yes. Um, I'm just going to go first to your point about the debt exchange program being non-binding. It's very important mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that we understand what that means. Right. You know, the government went to the Attorney General and asked for advice as to whether or not they could compel the bondholders to accept the new terms. Right. Right. The Attorney General said, no, you, you went into an you open can't contract, you can't just change your contract. Yeah. You agreed to take money from someone, you can't just tell them you're not gonna pay yeah. them. You have to agree with them what you're going to, what, what's going to be the, the, the way forward for, mm -hmm. between the two of you in the agreement. Mm -hmm. But there's a much more important part about this idea of non-binding, yeah. or that it's um, that that people, um, it's non-compulsory. What it means is that yeah. if everyone accepts the change mm -hmm. um, from the old bonds to the new bonds, what they're effectively agreeing to in a non-compulsory non way mm -hmm. is that we're changing the amount of interest that the government pays. Mm -hmm going from government paying 21% yeah. blended across all the maturities right. mm -hmm. down to 10%. Mm -hmm. And because it's voluntary, the government and the Bank of Ghana and, the, and all the regulators going forward will be able to turn around and say, wait, you've all accepted that actually the rate for Ghanaian local bonds is around 9%, not 21% anymore. That makes it a much more going forward, structurally stable mm -hmm. environment for issuing more debt. Because the issue is that, yeah. of course, mm -hmm. if you pay 21% interest yeah. on debt, mm -hmm. let's say you have $100 million today. Yeah. You pay $21 million, 21, uh, $21 million out today. Mm -hmm. Next year, you'll pay another $21 million. In four years' time, you've paid $81 million plus interest, right? Yeah. So it, that means that if you're paying 21% interest every, every year, every four years, or actually every three and a half years is the real calculation, mm -hmm. you have to double the capital base. And of course, you can't expect for the Ghanaian government mm -hmm. to double its output every four years. It's impossible, right? And so actually it's absolutely necessary that we drop the interest rate down from 21 
down to nine. It actually needs to be lower, but for now, that's as far as we can get. And it actually changes structurally the economy. What government told us was that there was going to be a zero rate at coupon uh, for this year, 2023. Yes. That's been reversed with the banks. We're dealing with 5%. Yes. Is that going to compound the problem? Um, no, I think that that's actually... So one of the most difficult parts of the new terms that the government was offering was that it, was, it said it was not going to pay right. any coupon this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Now, it's really difficult for an economy in which all the institutions right. use government paper for income, whether it's pensions, whether it's uh, insurance companies, uh, whether it's banks. The pensions, for example, are 73% invested in government paper. Right. That's way too much of our risk. Mm. And like the entire pension risk yeah. of all the workers be invested in the government. It's like you work for the government, the government pays you, then you give your money to the government to give you more interest. That's like concentrating all your risk in the government. If something goes wrong, Waboka. Then you're doomed. Waboka. That's where we are now, right? <laughs> so now what's going to happen is because the government can no longer pay 21%, yeah. everyone's going to accept that we can't give the government our money anymore because it's not going to pay us 21%. This is called crowding out, right? So the government, because it was paying so much money in interest, was crowding out the rest of the mm. economy. Mm. Nobody else was getting money to do anything. And so as a result, the government, of course, as a result of that, is yeah. unable to pay mm -hmm. that interest. Right. But number two, the rest of the economy is suffering. So this restructuring is actually very important because right. one of the unintended consequences, or maybe not under, unintended, is that the, the crowding out will be reversed. Yeah. And for people to earn 20%, 21% anymore, they need to go and do some proper work. work. The bankers need to work, the investors need to work, and they need to find opportunities that will generate that profit. But there's that passionate appeal, exempt individual bondholders and those who belong to the uh, pensioner class, yes. amounting to some 10 billion. But here's the bigger picture. Bonds to be exempt uh, just to meet that target. Of course, government is indicating that it wants to uh, reduce public debt by some 130 billion in all. Mm -hmm. That would have been 70% of the total domestic debt as of September last year. Uh, looking at the amount we're dealing with in terms of the individual bondholders and then the pensioner class, it would just be amounting to 10 billion. We'll, we'll explore the alternatives shortly. Uh, but let's move to the next point uh, and, and paint that picture. So, so the next slide would give us that, uh, the sense of what's happening right now. This is a picture of what's happening to our economy right now and yes. what the projections are. The World Bank is saying, well, 2.7% expansion, that's what they're projecting. And that's similar to the rate of the IMF, because the IMF is de dealing slightly higher than the World Bank figures. Looking at where we are now, it appears that it will have a total impact on what's going to happen to inflation as well. It will be the fifth highest in Africa. Why is this the case? Um, sorry, why will inflation yeah, be Yeah, so because high? there's a corresponding effect on, on, on the general price of goods and services. It's, it's still going to be relatively high, 20%. So, I mean... If inflation averages to 20%, that's a good thing because right. we've already had such a high rate of inflation over the last... 54.1 as of... Right, so we're now year. at 54 year on year from December. Right. And the reason the inflation has been so high has been this sort of unanchoring of the CD, this accelerated devaluation that we saw last year. Um, if there's a deal, if there's an IMF deal and there's dollars flowing in, right. um, what happens is that the CD stabilizes and that then puts a lid on inflation. If we can move back to 20% inflation, eventually get back to 10%-ish inflation, uh, and you know, there's the scope for it to, to, to be better than that. But for now, the key is if you can get to 21%, 20% inflation as opposed to 50, then I think uh, people in the country will start to feel more confident again in business activity. But I guess the projection has been done based on projections that would have been running the austerity plan with the IMF by then. Yes. Um, so the projection is done based on the drivers of CD devaluation. Drivers of CD devaluation are, uh, uh, sorry, the drivers of CD devaluation are um, uh, ex uh, basically um, uh, increases in interest rates outside of the country, so you develop markets interest rates, but also on um, uh, dollar outflows out of the country, weakening the CD. And that prediction is based what, on what the IMF factory is, is dealing with. Okay, so here's where the whole argument is about the pensioner class, those who are the aged, who are really worried about their investment, and the individual bondholders. I'm so surprised that um, the total amount of the bonds will be giving us some uh, 8 billion 
Ghana cities. That's what it's, it's amounting to in terms of the total amount. Uh, but when it comes to those who belong to the pension class, we know of the Esla and Dachi bonds as well. As you were talking about, we are, we are putting all of them into the bonds uh, as well. So if you put the two together, we're coming to 10.32 billion. Mm. The question is, can we really exempt these people? And, and how do we make up for, for that figure? That's a great question. Right. So the total exposure of Ghana's bond right. is 180 billion. billion. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, the total exposure to Ghana's domestic debt is 180 billion dollars. Um, if you, the, the government is trying to get to 80% mm -hmm. to claim success, but that's a number that's just been decided, right? Yeah, put right. So it's kind of open to some movement. Yeah. I suspect, considering that the IMF and the World Bank are so keen for Ghana to go through what's called the, uh, the, the common framework, the G20 common framework, and the fact that uh, Ghana has become a poster child for how to resolve these types of frontier market debt issues, I suspect that the IMF and the World Bank would be willing to accept some kind of fudge around 75 to 70 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case, that means the government has a bit more room, right? right? So the individual bondholders are worth, I think, about 6 percent. Yeah. The pension funds are worth about 6 percent. Which is way less. Which is way less yeah. than you expected. And then the foreign, foreign holders of Ghana local debt are about 9 percent. Right. So those together is 20 percent, roughly, 21 percent, yeah. right? So if you can get some of them across the line, then you're actually, you might get above 70 Of what benefit will it be to the government if we still go ahead and touch those bonds? So here's the deal, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, what, if you, if, if, if you have to understand what is structurally happening. Right. What is structurally happening is that everyone needs to get on the bus which says, a government cannot pay 21% interest. So those holdouts, wealthy individual bondholders or pensions, pension holders who've worked all their lives and committed their money to the government, they all have to accept that in an investment environment, you have to make your decisions and not concentrate your investments. And in this case, everyone has concentrated their investments because there's a structural problem. So the government is trying to get people to move across so that we can have a more sustainable picture going forward. Mm. We'll pay you interest, we'll have government bonds, but we're only going to pay you 9, 10%. Um, I think that like, ultimately there will be some people who will be exempted. And I suspect they'll be exempted on uh, maybe on welfare terms. So mm. we could say there's a threshold below yeah. which uh, you're exempted. So let's say if you have 250,000 CDs worth of government bonds, then you're exempted. We'll allow that to pass. Everything above goes through the process. Mm. Um, and we're doing it purely because you're a senior citizen, you've contributed your whole life, and actually we can afford to make sure that you are you're, you're well. So, so is government between a rock and a hard place? Uh, the, the, I mean, to the extent that they can't even do anything about this? Well, Try and the, work the, with the figures a bit I think and allow, the, I think allow the, the exemption? I think that the government is doing something about it. The conversations that are happening now, mm -hmm. which have resulted, by the way, in some pretty good improvements right. to the terms. Okay, so now they're paying a 5% coupon, yeah, right? for 2023. And, um, they, and everyone has agreed that the new blended rate is going to be 9% after 2023. So you've got some, uh, the, so the, the new framework is actually pretty clear already. Right. If you get some extra additional exemptions inside it, that's great. The one thing I would like to say is that it's very important that people understand mm -hmm. The, there is, if you actually choose to exchange your debt, right. right, then you benefit from the fact that the balance of people, the 80% who are ex accepting the debt exchange program, mm -hmm. ultimately are going to come back to the market, right? They're going to bring their money back More to the market money. into the new instrument. So the new instruments will start to appreciate, right? It's happened every single time. It happened in Greece in 2012 mm -hmm. when they restructured after the Eurozone debt crisis. It happened in Jamaica, 2010, 2013, when they restructured, when they had 140% debt to GDP. Right. It happened in the Latin American debt crisis. Every single time you restructure these bonds. Why? Because money wants a return. And guess what? Despite the current state of Ghana, yeah. the reality is we're on a... Trajectory, if yeah. you go back 10 years and look at, look at the skyline of Accra, for example, Ghana is a different country in just 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you have this cyclical uh, pressure because we borrow too much money and then become, um, uh, 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 it, it, we, we enter a period of being unstable because right. there's a balance of payments problem. Mm -hmm. That happens every seven years mm -hmm. because of the structure of our economy. And investors know that. So that's why they demand very high returns, mm -hmm. right? 
um, 20%, 21%. Right. But the problem is paying those returns causes the problem. So when the problem comes and it becomes unstable, they then have to decide whether to agree to the change. Okay, I, I want just to deal with the alternatives. Then we get back to the Jamaican example because that's the most recent government has been relying on. Yeah. But some have pointed to our expenditure, capital expenditure, uh, as one of the alternatives that we could explore in yeah. terms of doing the exemptions. So right from 2018, it's been shooting up in terms of our expenditure to where we are now, 2023. Mm -hmm. The projection, according to the uh, budget estimate, is that we may be spending some 27 plus billion Ghana cities on capital expenditure. Yeah. The belief is, well, because of the political cost, you don't want to totally say, well, I won't spend on capital expenditure. Yeah. So slash that by 50%, you'll still be dealing with some 17, 15 billion plus on capital expenditure and exempt the individual bond holders. Is that a feasible way out? Um, okay, first thing I'd say yeah. is that this number mm -hmm. divided by two is roughly eight and a half. Yeah. 16 plus eight and a half is uh, 24. So most of this growth, yeah. most of this from here to here is because of the devaluation in the city. Most of these CapEx oh. expenditures are priced. Something we weren't looking at. Right, so right. this is a city number. So a lot of that is because of the devaluation of the city. That's neither here nor there, okay. actually. Mm -hmm. In truth, um, the government up, you're right. The government needs to go and look in the budget mm -hmm. and it needs to look for projects which haven't been started yet, which have been budgeted for. Okay. Projects which can be delayed, projects which have been have a bit of money spent, but we can delay them. Mm -hmm. Those they need to look there, there will be projects in the budget that they can find to reduce this. Let's go with the 22. Yeah. 22 okay, so you want us to do with to reduce that with this, with this, it's, with this amount. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, yeah. but it, you can reduce the number because. The point is that, remember, after this battle right, with the local bondholders, there's another battle with the external bondholders. And right. they'll be looking at what the local bondholders are agree. doing. At the moment, the local bonders are, are agreeing to quite a large loss, which means that the euro bonds might get cut, like 80% 80, 80 mm -hmm. haircut, right, mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on what the local bond guys right. are accepting. Now, the, for the euro bond guys to accept mm -hmm. that, because you know, they're, like, they're all sat in London, yeah. they're like, OK, fine. You need to show us that you've done the work. Show us that you've reduced your capex. You've looked for areas in the budget because right now the budget is rubbish. That's what they'll say. And then there'll be pressure on the government to reduce it. We've all been saying this. You have to reduce your expenditures. Don't build the cathedral. You need to do X, Y, Z to find some money because if you don't find that money, then the bondholders won't go along with you. right? So the external bondholders who are now staring at a massive haircut will need to see that the government is found. But what's on top of your, what's on top of your head in terms of some of the, uh, I mean, capital expenditure that we, we can do away with? Uh, well, first of all, stop the cathedral, right? That, you, you want the cathedral? It's an option. It's, well. it's an important one because everyone is sat here going, we need to invest in things that result in immediate productive capital returns, mm -hmm. right? Things that improve our productive capacity. The cathedral could improve tourism, right. but the amount of money we have All to spend set. to get there means that we shouldn't do it right now. And everyone's saying it, even they themselves, a couple of the trustees have come and said, you know, maybe we should pause it for whatever reason they've right. said, right? So there's the cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that there are, uh, like we've been saying the same things for months and months right. and months now. A review of, SC, of, of free SHS is important. The review to, to in see fact, it. I was just about to go there because beyond this, and, and we'll show that to you shortly, government has some flagship projects that they are running. Yes. So let's get to the flagship pro projects then. In terms of the budgetary allocation, here's a sense of how we've been spending over the years. Yep. 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, it dropped a bit in 2021, but we're shooting up to 9.2 billion Ghana cities, yeah. which is equally close to that amount of 10 billion that the individual bondholders are looking for, yeah. for a way out exemption. So do we well, go ahead, know, take you, away the free you, SHS, take you, away you, you can, uh, the one district one factory I'm and not, some of these policy measures? I'm not measures. saying that you can get rid of 10 billion right. cities, right? Because again, remember, this number and this number mm -hmm. are linked right. through the devaluation of the city, right? Most of these expenditures are flagship programs are priced in dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's probably about 50, there's probably about 5 million cities of this, right. which that can is go due away. to CD devaluation. No, which is due to CD devaluation, right? So already, this number, mm -hmm. unless it's not been adjusted properly, right. factors for CD devaluation. So already they've taken some projects out. 
but they haven't told us properly what those projects are. The number should be bigger. If this is a CD number mm -hmm. in the new budget, then it should be bigger than this, but it's not. How about taking a bit of this and a bit on the capital expenditure? I, I think that you can take a bit out. I mean, I, absolutely, but what are we really talking about? We're talking about across the board, realistically, you might achieve $1 billion mm. of, of, of savings across expenditures. Right. Any more than that, and you're actually hurting the country. Remember, not only have you restructured the bonds, so you're pay, the, and, and everyone is invested in government paper, right? right. Not, in Ghana, not only are they invested in government paper, all business is really controlled by government right. because all the money goes to government, so mm -hmm. the government makes all the decisions. Right. right. So that's another thing that has to change right now because it cannot be the government who make, who make these decisions because if the government makes these decisions, mm -hmm then um, ultimately the government, then the private sector is not able right. to have any influence over these numbers. And so the, the power has to shift now yeah. to the private sector to get given the money directly, to spend that money transparently, and then to see the gains in the economy overall. The government cannot be so central to a, a lot of these things. So you agree that we can do away with the individual bondholders? Um, like I say, I what, think- What do you see happening? I suspect that what's going to happen is that um, the, bond the individual bondholders are now going to be the leading lights that promote the agreement between the Ghana Association of Bankers and the government, right? Because mm. now I suspect that what, should, what, what will happen is that everyone should start to fall in line now. They've been given a 5% coupon for this year, which means now they have some income. Mm -hmm. The banks can earn some money in servicing those, those uh, corporate actions. Um, and, and that will be very helpful for making sure that there's some, 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 some capital flowing right. through the economy. And I think, I think now that they've agreed to pay that coupon, it was a big offer to, to, to give them 5% instead of zero, um, shows you that the government's negotiation strategy, which was to go for zero right. and then force everyone to come to five, it seems to have been... The next chapter would be the external... Um, I mean, that portfolio. Uh, we'll get to that, but let's do the comparative analysis of what happens elsewhere. Gavman has often talked about what's happening in Jamaica, for example. Yeah. Are we following the blueprint as supposed to be? Um, so, I mean, no, no, no process is identical, right. obviously, because every situation is unique, the environment as well as the, the patient themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this case, um, there is some, uh, some following of the Jamaican process, right. but not fully. Remember that the government basically was behind the curve on agreeing, deciding to go to the IMF all of last year. Oh, we should have gone earlier. Yeah. All of last year kept saying, oh, we're not going to go, we're not going to go, we're not going to go, we're not going to go. Even in June, we're not going to go. Which meant that they were behind the curve. As soon as they decided to go, now you're, you're against time. If you had gone in January or if you'd gone in September of 2021, right. then you'd have had plenty of time to come to an agreement and include everyone and have a conversation about what's the right thing and what philosophically is actually happening here. But because there was no time, they had no choice. They went to the external consultants. The external consultant says, this is the pathway. And then they go, okay, right? And throw it to the people and see if they'll bite knowing full well it's like three weeks to Christmas, Every, it's, it's dirty December, everyone needs to chill Wants to spend, yeah. So we'll make sure that we get to Christmas with a bit of confidence, right? Um, we show that we've got a plan, the city will strengthen, then the pensioners come, they're like, whoa, exempt us. Yeah. And the government goes, okay, fine, we'll exempt you. Yeah. Knowing full well that we come back in January and have the proper conversation. I think that the feeling of, of, of not being consulted by all the various players is because of that timing. And now that they've all sat around the table, most have now sat around the table, they can now see eye to eye. I reckon they can see where the government, Charlie, the situation is rough, right? There's four weeks left. There's no, after four weeks, there'll be no money left for imports. So it's really important. Now that's why the cocoa bud thing happened yeah, over the weekend, yeah, right? Because yeah. ultimately they need to send a message. Charlie, there's no money. So let's get this deal done. If they don't agree in the next week, then what will happen is that the next extension takes us beyond the deadline that would allow us to get to the IMF executive board, which would mean that the IMF will not be able to make a decision before March. And if they can't make a decision before March, then it'll be June, mm -hmm. and we can't afford to get to June. If we, if, if we don't get a deal, we run out of dollars, then we're looking at this acceleration of the crisis where you don't have money for petrol, there's like just, just a shortage of dollars, CD goes to 20, it's a nightmare. The, the big intervention here will be the IMF um, bailout. Yes. Government is targeting the first quarter of this year. Is that your projection as well? 
um, I think it's crucial that we get an agreement before March. Because Else. If, because if we don't, we'll run out of dollars. If we run out of dollars, then we're in Sri Lanka's boat from last year. Right? Do so you we, fear that we may get that? Um, I, I, I think that people's minds should be sharpened by the fact that the city has gone from eight in December back to 13 in January. That's a huge move, right? right? So it went from 15 to eight and back, back to 13. To That's the market saying, Charlie, we need a solution. We need it fast because otherwise we're going to go back to 15 to 16 to 18 to 20 if we don't move. But honestly, if we don't get this deal done, then everyone will be stuck because they're, where, where do we get the dollars from? You need a bilateral agreement just to go and buy petrol. It's not going to work. So everyone needs to shop in their minds. You've traded in London. Yes. What are some of the best practices there to adopt? Best practices for who? Well, at least looking at the situation in which we find ourselves. Um, I think that it depends from which, frame, uh, who, yeah. which stakeholder you're talking about. Okay. If it's the government, the best practice to, 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 uh, to adopt now is one of full clarity and full communication. And do it with your chest out. Do it confidently. This is the path we've chosen to take. Everybody come with us. Let's, uh, of course, we're including you, but let's go. But we're doing You're looking at the next elections, don't, don't forget. It's not just the next elections. There's a huge argument to come with the external bondholders. And the external bondholders will look to the Ghanaian local bondholders for their cue. Whatever the Ghanaian bondholders accept is what will flavor the terms for the external bondholders, right? So, it, so, so it's really important that the government says, hey, Charlie, we are all the ones, we day for ground now. So come, let's go together. Because guess what? There's $28 billion that's owed to external bondholders. And that needs to come down way more than the CDs comes down. Because it's the exposure to dollars that really weakens, leaves us exposed to CD devaluation, right? So if you can fix that problem and haircut the external bondholders from 28 down to what, 10? That'd be amazing. That's We're going back to the IMF 17 times or 16. Yes. Yeah, 16, 17. This will be the 17. Okay, 17. Downward spiral is what some describe our economy to be. We're always going back to the bridge inwards. Yeah. What's your diagnosis of the problem? So I don't know whether it's accurate to call it a downward spiral right. if it's persistent, right? It is the structure of our economy. And why? Basically, it's because our business model is grow and sell, right? So grow some cucumbers, mm -hmm. grow some Dope. passion fruit, mangoes, pineapple, and send them to London, or dig and sell, dig some gold, dig some lithium, give it to the white guys up in London, right? That's our business model. And the worst thing about it is, not only is that our business model, we only take 10 CDs, or sorry, 10 pesos in the city, or best case for oil is like 18 pesos in the city, right? Or 18 cents in the dollar right. for the stuff that we are Selling producing. So that business model leaves you constantly broke, constantly broke. And if you stay with that business model, you will stay broke. It's simple. Um, the only way to fix it is to change the structure of your economy so that you're creating stuff. You know, don't import series juice from South Africa. We've got tons of pineapples, got loads of workers, make juice and sell it to the people, right? Keep it inside. For, that, that's just juice. Everything is up for play. And Ghana is an economy where because so much money gets given to the government, no one has money to invest in the stuff we need. So we literally just play this game where the government goes and borrows some dollars throws it into the economy, then everyone basically borrows those dollars Back and, goes, and then goes and buys toothpicks or <laughs> serious juice or some importation tatty stuff in. from China, right? And bring it back or, or buy oil, yeah. bring it back in, right? And so the point is that you can't have a model where you borrow dollars, give it to the people and say, hey, go and buy stuff from China. Because why? If you go and buy stuff from China, you're not creating jobs for our young people. But, but it's not as though we've not made attempts to industrialize. Look at uh, government's policy, for instance, of the one district, one factory. Yeah. So the government gets yes. criticized. Mm -hmm. I'm not here as a government yeah. show, yeah. but the Definitely. government gets criticized for 1D1F. No one ever stops and goes, wait, someone four years ago, six years ago, eight years ago thought, maybe we need to industrialize, so let's make a program. The efficacy of the program is a whole different story. And that's a story uh, yeah. about our efficiency, transparency, and we as a people, our structures, and whether we can 
we can build, whether our system works. Yeah. That's a whole different story. But someone six years ago, seven years ago, sat down and thought, we're going to need import substitution. We're going to need to increase productive capacity. So let's make a program. Whether or not the program has worked is another matter. But the fact that that program is in place should be a message to everyone. The, the goal is to replace imports, increase productive capacity, and ultimately, because the city has weakened so much, mm. guess what? Our stuff is super valuable. Our labor is super cheap. So we can export that stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's labor, whether it's you know, juices that we create, whether it's whatever we produce, yeah. we can export it, and, and, and it's, our exports are more attractive to outsiders. Imagine how much of our cocoa is being sold via Ivory Coast and Togo because, or Ivory Coast and up north because there's a much better return if you sell it in CIFA. Right. That means it, our economy is now geared properly for export. The more we export, the more we earn because the city is weak. And that should spur us to move towards productive capacity okay. because we can't afford imports anymore. And we've been reliant on the US dollar. It's not as though we can do without it since we import some more. Uh, but government's unique attempt to wean itself off the US dollar in terms of our petroleum consumption has been the gold for oil exchange. I'm sure that you've heard of that bilateral arrangement. Is it sustainable in the first place? Well, first of all, the way you frame the question suggests that we have to accept that the dollarization of our economy is the way it's going to be, right? Because you know what, every business holder, I myself am one, I own a dollar account at my bank. So in theory, when I earn CDs, I could just go to the bank and say, give me dollars and put it in my right. dollar account. That's the dollarization of the account, right? Everything, all the earnings, all the safety, everything is in dollars. It's very dangerous for us to say that we can't do without dollars. There are many countries who are starting to get to the point of doing without dollars. There's something called the Enbridge program, which is a, a, a central bank digital currency driven program being run by, with, between the Chinese and, some, and, the, and the Gulf countries and okay. some others. Right. The amazing thing about this program is it allows them to trade oil for Chinese yuan. They don't need to use dollars. And so guess what? Uh, we have this program, whether or not it'll work is another matter. Right. But we have a program called Gold for Oil. And the point of gold is that gold for oil is that rather than uh, exchanging the gold for dollars, mm -hmm. which are scarce, and then using those dollars to go and buy the oil, yeah. we go to the person who's selling the oil and say, hey, we've got gold. It's perfectly fungible with, gold, with, with dollars. So take the gold and you go and do the exchange, right? Um, now, that will work based on or as far as the person who is receiving CDs can digest those CDs, right? Let me, let me, let me frame that okay, for you. Yeah. So let's say uh, Total Energies, who are a big seller of petrol in this country. Total Energies earn CDs. And what they want to do is they want to sell those CDs and collect dollars so they can take the dollars home to France yeah. or euros and take the euros home to France. That's what they want to do, right? Um, now what the government is saying is, okay, we're going to give you gold instead. Um, but to get gold, they have to give someone, they have to get the gold from someone. So yeah. the person, the gold manufacturer gets given CDs, right? Because the, the government's not going to give them dollars, yeah. they're going to give them CDs. CDs so yeah. it depends on how much CDs the gold manufacturer can digest. If there's productive capacity in Ghana for them to spend those CDs on, then they'll take the CDs up to the point where they can no longer spend those CDs. So it depends on how much they can digest. So let's say Total Energy spends $50 million worth of CDs inside Ghana every year. They'll take CDs up to that $50 million. Once that, we exceed that. Then they can't digest it. They don't have anything. So to it's do. not sustainable. So start pushing back. It becomes sustainable if you increase your productive capacity inside the country. The more service you can make Total pay for in the country, the more CDs they can digest. The Gold for Oil program only works if you also have an increase in productive capacity. And you have to do it carefully so you don't get to the point where they can't digest the CDs anymore. It's not a foregone conclusion. It has to be handled with care, well, as uh, with all tools, right? Anyway, how long do you think it would take us to get back to normal? I don't know what's normal at this point, and I don't know what reference point to use, but in your sense of normalcy. Let me ask you a question. In 2014, the city devalued between 2013 and uh, early 2013 and August 2014, so about a period of a year and a half. Right. Not dissimilar to what we've just been through, right? 
How long did it take to get back to normal? You went back to, you went to IMF 2014, 2016, there was a, you know, 2017, extension. there was a new government, and then somehow they got out, yeah. they did some stuff. It felt like it was it a was working. Then a few years later, <laughs> I mean, COVID got in the way. A few years later, we're like, oh, this is not good, actually. So I, how long is a piece of string? I suspect there's a chance that if we're lucky, we get a deal quickly, and then the outsiders, the Oyibos up north, uh, see us favorably and decide maybe they'll give us some FDI again, then there's a chance that we recover very quickly. Mm -hmm. The thing to remember about Ghana is we're talking about an IMF deal that's going to give us $3 billion. $3 billion is change, is petty change. It's not enough. Small monies, mm -hmm. right? And the whole economy has been ground to a halt on $3 billion. So if you can find small bits of money, $500 million will go a long way. Like we saw it over Christmas. I don't know how much dollars... The Bank of Ghana had, but the small that they had managed to swing the city from 15 to 8. It doesn't take a lot. Um, so the, you know, there's, there's, there's the long game of get the 3 billion, which is not a lot, and then you have to find some other monies, right? So maybe you go and find some bilateral partners, maybe the guys in the Gulf, and you say, hey, we need not just gold we can give you, yeah. bring some money so we can increase and the amount that. of gold. You know, you can go to Saudi, you can go to Dubai, I don't know. They, they, everybody's looking for places to invest. They also need raw materials. This is, after all, a commodity boom that we're in. So, Charlie, we're in actually a very powerful position. Once we get our heads around, sort this deal out, get the IMF in, and then the recovery can be very fast. Very fast. Is there something that you're hoping government will do besides relying on the IMF? Um, I mean, the government is responsible for creating the bedrock for, for business economy, activity, right. for economic activity. That needs to be where all their focus is. No longer should government be responsible for making all the economic decisions, spending decisions. They should be focused on how do we create the bedrock, right? Um, and everything now is, and to be fair to them, they're kind of making the sounds like they are, right? Talking about strengthening the city, go for oil, talking about import substitution and, 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 and stopping uh, the advancing of dollars for imports of certain things. There's a rice revolution going on, increasing the amount of rice being grown in Ghana. Let's come back in 10 years and let's see. 10 years, right? How much rice is Ghana growing? Are we growing enough to export? Then we can assess these guys. Right now, it just looks like a big black hole and no one really knows what's going on. But if you want to know what's happening in Ghana, you have to go forward 10, 10 years and then look back and say, oh, wow, okay, despite all of the cyclical up and downs and the pain and the suffering and the city devaluation, despite all of that, this is the development pathway that we've been, that we've been on. And it looks like that development pathway is consistent. Fine brain. Uh, but the, 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 the argument is you, you don't avail yourself, and I'm not just talking about you, but about the others who have similar you know, capacity to turn things around. So that's why I'm, I'm asking you that question. Are you willing to avail yourself, for instance, uh, if, if need be, for you to support our economic recovery program? Well, look, I have to defend myself. Mm -hmm. I think I am availing myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am um, Asasi Radio. I have a radio show on Thursday night, 7 o'clock every night. Come and listen, please. We talk about these issues deep and we make it accessible. Mm -hmm. My goal is to help every Ghanaian really understand this right. stuff to an extent that you wouldn't understand in London or anywhere else in the world. Because guess what? As a developing nation, our people need to understand economics more than mm -hmm. they do. I'm, I have a juice company. I make juice. So I employ people to actually produce stuff and then to try and like live this, 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 this lifestyle of trying to contribute to my country by creating jobs and producing stuff locally that hopefully eventually we can export and go and earn fat pounds from London. That would be nice. So I'm here, and I'm here, I'm here right now, <laughs> talking to you, your lovely people. <laughs> anyway, uh, Kuku, it's been a pleasure having you the here, of course, uh, and I'm sure that we'll have you from time to time, uh, so we can talk about issues relating to the economy, Kuku, and the Bolisan Investment Banker uh, here on The Pulse. <laughs>